day teachings and I want to thank you for making this part of your regular schedule for Tuesdays. Today, we're going to continue our discussion on the article, I Believe in the Holy Spirit. Last week, I indicated that so far, we've been dealing with the belief in God the Father and the other articles relate to Jesus Christ directly. So we have turned attention to the Holy Spirit. In other words, the first part of the creed center on the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And we focus primarily on three things. This was a picture I was talking about that you can find in the Vatican. That when it's, the sun shines through in St. Peter's Basilica, it's so beautiful. So last week, you looked at three things. Who remembers them? Three important things that we discussed last week. The first one was, who is the Holy Spirit? that we went on to look at the titles of the Holy Spirit. And the last one was the signs or symbols associated with the Holy Spirit. And in discussing who is the Holy Spirit, we mentioned that the Holy Spirit, that is if you say Holy Spirit, you are referring to the third person of the Trinity, whom we adore together with God the Father and God the Son. I guess the question would be, so how did we know that he was called the Holy Spirit? The answer is simple. Jesus Christ revealed that to us. So we got the name of the third person of the Trinity through the teachings of Jesus Christ. Then we also looked at the titles of the Holy Spirit. Remember, we went through a lot of Bible passages, and the whole idea was to try and see the many ways that Scripture talks about the Holy Spirit. The famous one is the Paraclete or the Advocate the one who is called to our side to assist us. What other titles do you remember? Comforter. Which other one? The Spirit of God. Spirit of Truth. The Sanctifier. Okay, which other one? Can you raise your hand? I call you a talk. Spirit of promise. Yes. Spirit of glory. Finger of God. So those are beautiful. I've told that you are scripture scholars. So when I'm preparing for Tuesday teachings, I'm so happy. You know, it's not like I'm only coming to give. You also remember what I give, and it makes it very enriching. So spirit of truth. Spirit of promise, Spirit of Christ, Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of adoption, the Spirit of adoption, the Spirit of glory, the Spirit of God. So these are the various titles of the Holy Spirit that we looked at. And again, they all reflected ways in which Scripture talks about the Holy Spirit. So after looking at those ways, we now want to look at the signs or symbols of the Holy Spirit. How the Holy Spirit is communicated to us through signs and symbols. And you remember that the first one we looked at was, the first one wasn't fire. Fire is one of them, so it's true. But we started by looking at water. And we went to the extent 
of looking at a baptismal font, how we blessed water for baptisms. And through that, we said that every baptism is an action of the Holy Spirit. Because in blessing the water, we invoke the presence of the Holy Spirit even before we carry out baptism. That we talked about fire, which is true. And we use this passage from Acts of the Apostles. And also where Paul talks about the idea that don't quench the spirit. And we say that Paul is making an allusion or drawing from the symbol of fire. Because fire that you quench, right? So don't quench the spirit. Then we also look at anointing. How anointing is an essential way of imparting the Holy Spirit. Anointing goes with sealing. So on your confirmation day, the bishop lays his hands on you and says that be sealed with the Holy Spirit. Right? Then the finger of God. And we even sang that song. Finger of God's right hand. His promise teaching little ones. So it says an ancient symbol that when you mention the finger of God, you are referring to the Holy Spirit. Then we looked at the dove. The dove. Referencing the baptism of Jesus. Today what I want us to focus on, there are many things we can do. One of them is to discuss the Holy Spirit and its influence in the life of the Christian. But since Pentecost will come and we'll have time to do such studies again, today I want us to just focus on the Holy Spirit in the church. That is my focus for today. And what I intend to do would be to trace how the Spirit of God was present in the ministry of Jesus but even more so, how the Spirit of God guided the early church and how God's Spirit guides the church today. So those are the three broad aims I'm looking at today. How the Spirit of God was part of the ministry of Jesus, how the Spirit of God guided the early church, and how God's Spirit guides us today. Now, if we are looking at the importance of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church, and we are beginning with Jesus Christ, the first story which comes to mind is what story? What story comes to mind immediately? With Jesus Christ, we don't go back to creation, but we would rather start from his birth the birth narratives. And so we look at Luke 1, 34 to 35. Already at the conception of Jesus, we, Luke makes us aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit. That that whole conception itself was an act of the Holy Spirit. So therefore, when Mary had told the angel, how can this be since I know no man, the angel responds, that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. So already from the beginning, we see God's Holy Spirit play an important role in the conception of Jesus. Now, fast forwarding this discourse, the next important point in the ministry of Jesus is his baptism. Because that is when he began his public ministry. So before Jesus would begin his public ministry, we see the Holy Spirit at work again. And here it is at his baptism. But if you read Matthew 4, 16, we are told that as Jesus was baptized, and he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. So, the Spirit of God comes to Jesus in a public way before Jesus will start his ministry. The next important part where you see the Spirit at work in the ministry of Jesus is what is referred to as the Nazareth Manifesto. 
where Jesus sets the agenda for his ministry. And you find that in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 20. Jesus goes to the synagogue and they hand him the scroll. And where he opens to is a passage of Isaiah which says that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. If you don't mind, let me take this off so I can breathe well before you see me falling on the ground. I hope you don't mind. Thank you. So here, this was when Jesus was launching his ministry. And you know how manifestos matter in political life, right? So when Jesus was launching his manifesto, he goes to that passage in Isaiah where he talks about the spirit of the Lord being upon him. So the first one was annunciation, the baptism, then the public ministry as manifested in the Nazareth Manifesto. So we see that the Holy Spirit was part of the mission of Jesus. So it is not surprising that before Jesus would leave, as we saw last week, Jesus would begin to prepare the disciples about the coming of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit was going to be with them. And we find a public manifestation of this on the day of Pentecost. And here, this is a story we all know very well. That the disciples were together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So, right from this point, we see that the Holy Spirit will begin to direct the affairs of the early church. So, Peter will be arrested together with the apostles. They are being whipped, and yet they are happy to have been found worthy to suffer for Jesus. Nobody could stop them from now on because the Holy Spirit was the one who was in charge. But friends, I want you to understand that at this point in the life of the church, the apostles were ministering to only Jews. So how would they now move from ministering to only Jews to ministering to non-Jews, those they call Gentiles. Again, it took the action of the Holy Spirit. So if you go to Acts chapter 10, read that whole story of what happened to Peter when he had a vision. And on that vision, a sheet came from heaven with all kinds of animals. And the command was rise and weep, uh, rise and eat. Peter says, mm -mm, nothing unclean has ever touched my mouth. It happened three times that a vision disappeared. And just after that, people came looking for him because he, has been sent by, he had been sent by Cornelius, who was a centurion, a Gentile. Because the centurion had also had a vision. So based on that, he sends people to the house of Peter. And God tells Peter that, no, go. I am sending you to them. He gets to the house and as he begins to talk to them, the Holy Spirit manifests itself so strongly that Peter will say, what can deny us from giving them baptism? 
So he baptizes them. The church will hear of it and they will question him, why did you do it? Why did you go to a Gentile territory? And he narrates the incident to them. And at that point, they could not but begin to embrace the Gentiles into their fold. So you see how the Holy Spirit with its own plan, with its own plan, will begin a church among the Jews and gradually begin to spread it. If you go to Acts chapter 15 again, you will see that there also was under controversy as to how those who were not Jews should be accepted into the church. This goes on back and forth, back and forth. Then the council will agree and say, we and the Holy Spirit have decided, Acts chapter 15, we and the Holy Spirit have decided that we won't place obstacles in your way. Then they give them the requirements that they would follow. So I want you here to just understand how the spread of the church is attributed to the action of the Holy Spirit. And we see it even more forcefully from Acts chapter 16 going. For instance, even before then, if you take Acts chapter 13, you will see that in the church in Antioch, we are told there were prophets and teachers. Then while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have set them. And what did they do? They pray, place their hands on them, and send them off. And they begin the first missionary journey. Again, you see how the spread of the church is an activity of the Holy Spirit. Now go to Acts chapter 16. Paul and Barnabas were moving on, doing their trips. And here, if you look at what is on the slide... You can really see that their direction was monitored and again influenced by the Holy Spirit. What does it say? Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word, from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Don't ask me why the Holy Spirit prevented them. I don't know the answer. But what I know is that the Holy Spirit was guiding how the church should spread. So at that point, he said that, no, go through Phrygia and Galatia. Don't go through the province of Asia. And then when they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed Mysia and went down to Troas. So we see how the Holy Spirit was directing the life of the church. That is the major point I want you to appreciate tonight. So friends, having given you this expose on how the Spirit was part of the mission of Jesus through the Annunciation, through the Baptism, through the Nazareth Manifesto and having drawn your attention to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost Day which is described as the beginnings of the church and how the Holy Spirit guided the spread of the church from Jewish to Gentile territories and how it even map up where Paul should go and where Paul shouldn't go we now want to reflect on so how do we experience the Holy Spirit in the church today? Because the church is the place where we know the Holy Spirit. The church is the place where we know the Holy Spirit. And that is reflected in, in the songs that sometimes we sing, songs about the Holy Spirit. Spirit define our tender prayer and make this house your own. Descend with all your gracious powers. 
So the church is the place where we know the spirit. How? How do we know the spirit in the church? The first one is through the scriptures. What is the Holy Spirit who inspired the scriptures? All scripture is inspired by who? The Holy Spirit. And is useful for training and for rebuking and for correcting error. But the man of God would not lack. So, it's the inspiration that the Spirit provides to the scriptures that we get to know the Holy Spirit in the church. But you see, for us Catholics, we don't say that we believe in only scriptures. Scripture is primary, yes. Scripture is the most important, yes. But in addition to that, we also believe in what we call tradition. Because, friends, the scripture itself came out of a tradition. And we have instances or stories or passages such, that, such as uh, uh, not all that Jesus did is recorded, right? You read from John. To tell you that there is more. And that more is part of the heritage of our church. If others don't believe in that, you shouldn't be surprised. Why? Because they don't share the history we share in. They picked up from somewhere else. So believing in tradition would now be like, so why did you go away? So they would only keep to the scripture, but we started from oh, oh, whatever. And because of that, we have our traditions as well. And through these traditions, we get to also experience the Holy Spirit. So that is why you would have things, something like a devotion to the Holy Spirit. You might not find it in scripture, but it is part of the treasures of the church. And through them, we get to know who the Holy Spirit is. But we also get to know the Holy Spirit in the church's magisterium. This big word here is a small word. Magister means teacher in Latin. So through the church's teachings, we get to encounter or we get to know the Holy Spirit. Through the many teachings of the church, we get to know the Holy Spirit. The other one is also in the sacramental liturgy. What do we mean? In the church's worship. We know the Holy Spirit through the church's worship. So, here, if you talk of worship, we are talking both of words and symbols. It is through those words and symbols that the Holy Spirit puts us in communion with Christ Jesus. So, for instance, let's look at baptism. When you are being baptized, what do we say? The priest will pour water over your head and say, Ebenezer, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Then if you read scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 13, Paul will begin to reflect on the Holy Spirit's role in baptism and what it means for everybody. And Paul will tell us, will tell us that for just as the body is one and has many members and not the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, Fantis or Ewes, Dagaris and Dagombes, everybody were all made to drink of one spirit. And that is why if you are a Catholic who has been baptized in the spirit and you are tribalistic, you don't understand your baptism. You want to privilege your tribe as the superior tribe over somebody else when all of us drank of the same spirit and were baptized in the same spirit. You need to examine your faith again. We will talk more about it when we pray that we study the Lord's Prayer, Our Father. But here I'm signaling a conversation that we all need to think about because on the radio we all hear discussions of tribalism and people will put religion aside and talk and talk and talk and on Sunday we are all here in one line coming to receive the body of Christ and we say we are one body. 
is not a paradox and contradiction in terms. So, Holy Spirit in the church. Now, let's also look at the Mass. In every Eucharistic prayer, Eucharistic prayers are the prayers we pray during which we transform or the bread and wine are transformed into the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. During that prayer, before the priest will say on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said a blessing. There is what we call the epiclesis, where the priest will stretch his hand and invoke the Holy Spirit's presence before he goes on to the institution narrative. So, for instance, what I said this evening is from what we call Eucharistic prayer too. There are many Eucharistic prayers, but the conventional ones are four. One, two, three, and four. This is from Eucharistic prayer too. So the priest stretches his hand on the bread and wine and says, Make holy therefore these gifts we pray by sending down your spirit upon them like they do fall. So they become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the action of the Holy Spirit at Mass. This is one major area where we see the Holy Spirit acting in a very profound way at Mass. We also know that the Holy Spirit also aids us in our prayers. You know, we can call him the prayer teacher. He teaches us to pray. And we find that in Romans 8.26, where we are told the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with size too deep for words. So yes, the Spirit helps us to pray well. Then also in the charisms and the ministries by which the church is built up, the Spirit finds itself reflected in the many societies and the many talents that we all bring to bear. So for instance, the charismatic renewal will be one of such societies. But even that, whether you take the sacred heart or the legend of Mary or Vincent de Paul, we all bring our talents bestowed by the Spirit of God to help build up the body of Christ. So whether we are catechists, whether we are priests, whether we are lay ministers, these are various charisms that as lay people and as religious and clergy, we all through the apostolic and missionary life manifest the presence of the Holy Spirit in the church. Then the last one is the witnesses of the saints. Another way we encounter the presence of the Holy Spirit is through the witnesses of the saints. Today, for instance, we are celebrating St. Lawrence. St. Lawrence lived in the third century. He was one of the deacons. And from the Acts of the Apostles, we know that the deacons were the ones who were in charge of the daily distributions of the church. Now there was a persecution and the Pope was killed, was murdered. And before the Pope would go away to be murdered, Lawrence asked him, where are you going without your deacon? And the Pope said that in three days you follow me. Now according to the story, the prefect of Rome, who was a greedy man, was interested in the treasures of the church. So he called Lawrence and asked him to bring to him all the treasures of the church. And Lawrence said, in three days, I will bring them. So Lawrence went around, gathered all the poor, all those the church were taking care of, and then went to the king and said that these are the treasures of the church the poor and the needy. And the king got so upset that he ordered his execution. And he was going to be killed by fire. According to the story, 
Lawrence was roasted. And what makes the story so profound was that think of what we do for kebab or barbecue. You know how you bend one side and you have to turn the other side. The story says that as they bent one side, Lawrence was the one telling them that this side is well bent. Turn me on the other side. Friends, if you don't have the strength of the Holy Spirit for a time like this, because I'm sure for some of us, once the fire touches us, we begin to scream and jump. And if we can free ourselves from the fire, we'll free ourselves. Right? So, how are these people able to give witness in that way? It is through the power of the Spirit that is in the church, which they believe in. So, my dear friends, let me summarize again what we have done today. We began by going over what we did last week. Who is the Holy Spirit? The titles of the Holy Spirit and the signs and symbols of the Holy Spirit. And I mentioned that today our focus is the Holy Spirit in the church. Before that, I made you aware that there are many things we can say about the Holy Spirit. But we are focusing only on the Holy Spirit in the church. When it's Pentecost time, we'll have time to talk about the gift of the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit, the role of the Spirit in the life of the believer and all that. But to be able to talk about the role of the Holy Spirit in the church, it is important to step back. Because Jesus is the founder of our church. So we looked at how the Holy Spirit was influential in the life of Jesus himself. At his conception, at his baptism, the Nazareth Manifesto. Then we came to the early church. How was the Spirit controlling the early church, directing the early church? And we looked at Pentecost, the birthday of the church. From there... We talked about how the Spirit was present in their actions among the Jews. So how did they cross over to the Gentiles, the non-Jews? We use the story of Cornelius as an example. The Council of Jerusalem as another example. Then we looked at the Paul. How the Spirit guided the areas that he would go. Where he was told not to go and where he should go to. Then we came to so how do we see the Holy Spirit in the church? We said through the scriptures, through the magisterium, the church's teachings, through our traditions, through the liturgy, the words and the symbols. And we went to baptism. Then we went to the mass. And then we said that also through the apostolic witness. And lastly, through the holiness of the saints. And we use the story of Lawrence to tie up the whole argument and to say that yes, the Spirit is present in the church. He is in the Catholic Church. So if you're a Catholic, don't let anybody tell you that the Spirit of God is not in your church. That they have it and we don't have it. I will say we have it more than them. And subsequent teachings I'll prove to you why I say that. What we don't do well, that we don't live in the power of the Spirit. We don't live in the power of the Spirit. So I want to encourage you that once you know that the Spirit is in the church, and the Spirit that guides the church, live in the power of the Spirit. Thank you. I'll pick your questions. Yes, sir. Uh, hello. Yeah. Sure. But, uh, um, sometimes we study some of these stories and then uh, we see that there is some distinction somewhere. For instance, uh, for instance, uh, the the example that has yet been given about Saint Lawrence. Now, I think it's comparable to say 
how Shadak, Meshach, and Abednego were delivered. Well, I believe they were delivered because they defied the deity, the look at nature and so on. And then you talk about uh, people defying uh, uh, the practices of the day, not to take uh, pork and so on, and some were killed and so on. So, based on this, if I may ask, when does the Holy Spirit intervene? When does the Holy Spirit intervene? intervene. Yes. As to why also, one person is killed. Thinking, yes. I was thinking, for instance, if you look at the story of uh, St. Lawrence. St. Lawrence did something spectacular. Giving the gold, sharing the gold and the, the, the treasures to uh, the sick, the blind, the lame, and so on and so forth. And then presenting them as representing the wealth of the church. But he was roasted. See, he was roasted. And uh, I was thinking the Holy Spirit would have intervened. For the early church, for the early work of the apostles, and Ananias and Sapphira, when they sold the cross of land and then came and told lives, I think it was the work of the Holy Spirit that put them to death. They died. As an example of uh, people encouraged to, to be of good behavior and so on, and to show examples to the outer world. So sometimes you look at it and say, ah, why is it that there was no intervention? Why is it that there was no intervention to save this or that? But there was intervention to save another. Uh, is the distinction so clear and uh, what is the justification for sex? Okay. I can't talk about justification because then I'm interpreting God. So I can't talk about justification because yeah. then I'm interpreting God. Uh -huh. But what I can say is that if there is anything we all know, there is a big question about the presence of evil. How do we explain it? And worse of how sometimes worse things happen to good people and those that we know are very bad seem to be enjoying. These questions have been part of the Christian history from time immemorial till now. Why is it that God didn't intervene or the Holy Spirit didn't intervene in the case of Lawrence? What about if that is how God wants Lawrence to glorify him? So that he gives us an example of how far we should be ready to go if we say we are Christians for him. For instance, we all live in a society whereby we keep complaining that things are not going well in our country. But how many of us are able as Christians to stand up and bring our values to bear and are ready to pay the cost? Sometimes we think of the cost you have to pay and if it's possible, you shy away small. And when you go, you go and pray, Lord, help the situation. So these examples are there. God could have intervened just as he can intervene in every situation. Sometimes he decides not to, to give us examples. Because he knows how the end should be that we don't know. The most important thing is how we ourselves believing the Holy Spirit are able to embrace these things as they come. Knowing that we are strengthened by the Holy Spirit to go through both fire and water. Because at the end of the day, the most important thing is where our souls are heading to. And for Lawrence, that was the way through which his soul will enter into the beatific vision. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask uh, or seek clarification on, um, okay, first you said um, one of the titles of the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. And Jesus Christ revealed the Holy Spirit to us. When we read the Bible, uh, in certain contexts, they'll say the Spirit of God. And another context, they'll say the Spirit of the Lord. 
and sometimes they say the Holy Spirit. Then when you go to Revelation, they'll say, even Isaiah, he says the seven uh, full spirit of God. And Revelation. Isaiah does not say the seven Holy Spirit of God. The, the, uh, the, uh, the seven spirit of God. Yeah. No. Okay. Isaiah does not say the seven spirit of God. Okay. It talks about the gifts, the counsel, wisdom, understanding. Okay, okay, okay. Correct. Okay, okay. So now, when you take Revelation, it takes, uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, says, it talks about what the seven spirits of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, are they one? Are they what? Uh, it take, uh, in certain contests, they'll say the Holy Spirit. When I explain the titles, the major point I brought to bear last week was that these are the various ways that the Spirit is presented in the Scriptures. So it's not always that they refer to him as the Holy Spirit. Okay. Sometimes he's referred to as the Spirit of the Lord, as the Spirit of promise, as the Spirit of adoption. Okay. So they are all variations of the same term be presented in different ways by different authors, but it talks about the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, a follow-up question is that when you take uh, Revelation chapter 3 verse 1, who talks about the seven full spirits of God, is it the same as the Holy Spirit? I need to go into the context of that before I can answer that. Okay. I want to make a pronouncement when I have not studied that. Okay. So I can look at that and revert back to you. Okay. 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 Thank you. Uh, my question is relating in, in relationship to discernment. I was reading a literature that says that um, the gift of discernment is one of the very high level gifts that one can have. I don't know whether it has a link with the Holy Spirit and, or whether it's part of the titles of the Holy Spirit. Can you give us some more light on that? Discernment is not a title of the Holy Spirit. It is what the Holy Spirit enables you to do. The Holy Spirit enables you to discern in particular situations what you should do A or do B or choose the path A or path B. But it's not in itself a title of the Holy Spirit. But these things don't come just like that. It comes with you developing a relationship with the Holy Spirit. It is based on that relationship we develop that you can begin to ask the Spirit to give you the spirit of discernment. Now, when you're confronted with situations, you would know what to do and what not to do. Because sometimes, if it's the situation is between good and evil, it's very simple. Whatever, if it's between two goods, you know that this is good, this is good. Which one should I choose? It becomes very difficult. That is where discernment becomes very important. But it starts from developing a relationship with the Holy Spirit. How do we do that? Would you want to start your day by spending five minutes and just focusing on the Holy Spirit's attention in your life? It's one way of doing that. You can read about passages of the Holy Spirit. Like how we are saying that the Spirit directed Paul not to go to Asia, but to go to this side. It means that the Spirit helped Paul to discern. Right? So discernment will come from practice. It will also come from developing a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Father, um, I've always wanted to ask this question about the Holy Spirit, and today seems to be very appropriate. In the Old Testament, I just want to ask about the characteristics of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and I'll give an example. For example, in the Old Testament, when Saul went to baptize David, Samuel, sorry. When Samuel went to baptize David, the scripture says that 
when he anointed him, the Spirit of God descended on David. Similarly with Saul, when Saul was baptized or anointed by Samuel again, the scripture says that the Spirit of God descended on Saul as well. In the case of Saul, which is where my question comes, when he went against the instructions of Samuel, the scripture says the Spirit of God departed from him. So my question is, these characteristics expressed in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, can we have the Holy Spirit with us and be bad to the point where it departs from us? Thank you for your question. Now, the first thing to take into account is that when Scripture says that Holy Spirit departed from Saul, it is as a result of a, a consequence of an act performed by the agent. If we come to the New Testament, we are cautioned that we can blunt the power of the Holy Spirit. So, for instance, Paul will tell the Thessalonians that do not quench the Spirit, meaning it is in our power to blunt the power of the Spirit. Secondly, Paul will tell Timothy, set into flame the Spirit you have received. Now, is it possible to let go of the spirit or allow the spirit or the spirit should leave you completely in the present dispensation since we say that confirmation gives us an indelible mark the spirit will be there but if you don't make use of the spirit we can compare it to the spirit leaving in a certain sense because what is there is as important only when you use it. Right? But in literal terms, we don't seem to have an example in the New Testament which shows strictly like what we have in the Old Testament. But if you think of it in terms of the fact that it is as a result of the agency of the actor, that makes the Holy Spirit either to be dormant or not dormant, then you can find certain parallels in the New Testament. Is that helpful? Thank you. Can we have a last question? Thank you for the teachings. Um, my question is two. One is on St. Lawrence, and then the second one is about um, the gift of tongues. And um, how do we relate the gift of tongues to the Holy Spirit? And then you see that in other churches, it's more like it's a foundation for them. Virtually everybody speaks in tongues. But in the Catholic Church, it's more like it's limited. Then my second question about St. Lawrence is, why is he well celebrated? You see, yesterday we celebrated St. Therese of Benedict, Benedicta. The Gloria was in said, oh, but for St. Lawrence, it's more like he's been celebrated like one of the leaders of the church, like when we celebrate St. Peter, St. Paul. I, I don't, I want to. Okay, so first of all, we don't celebrate Lawrence like we celebrate Peter and Paul. We don't. But in the churches, what we call the Sanctora cycle. Sanctora simply means saints. Cycle of saints, there are ranks. So for instance, the martyrs, who those who sacrifice their life or shed their blood, are ranked higher than those who died and because of certain virtues, are extolled as saints. So usually, depending on the kind of martyr who is being celebrated and how the end came, the church might introduce a gloria. 
But if it's uh, like St. Benedict of the Cross or St. Joseph of Avila, you know, these are not martyrs. So usually they will be mentioned, but we won't even wear red, we wear white. But if we wear red, then first of all, we talk about martyrs. But even in that, there are grades of martyrs. So depending on which area, category you fall, that will determine whether we will sing Gloria or won't sing Gloria. Now, if you go to other churches, it's like speaking in tongues is the foundation. If you come to the Catholic Church, it doesn't seem to be the foundation. Why? I don't know. What I know is that every Catholic can speak in tongues because it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. It is not really restricted for other churches. The group in the church which will pay more attention to that will be the charismatic renewal. You may have people who are not in the charismatic renewal, but because they have been praying and the Holy Spirit can decide to bestow on them the gift of praying in tongues. Is that helpful? Yes. But if somebody prays in tongues and the other does not pray in tongues, there is nowhere which suggests that that person is a better Christian. That one is a no-no. It doesn't mean that if you nobody prays in tongues and I don't pray in tongues, he's a better Christian. It doesn't mean that. Oh, I pray in tongues and nobody doesn't pray in tongues that I'm a better Christian than Norbert. It doesn't mean that. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Father, for all what you have taught us so far. But um, in some Christian denominations, they say, uh, we say God is Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But in some Christian denominations, they say God is only Father and Son. And when we speak of Spirit or the Holy Spirit, they, they interpret it to mean all kinds of things. Can you give me uh, examples? Sorry? Can you give me examples? Yes, I'm, I'm still coming. I mean, examples and, uh, of the Christian denominations. Um, say the Jehovah Witnesses, for example, they do not believe in the, the Holy Spirit. And um, the reason they give is that when you say Spirit or the Holy Spirit, it's, it, sort of, it sort of has a lot of meanings. It means wind. It means uh, breath. I, I had a chat with um, a Jehovah's Witness one time, and she was like, I said, I mean, a human being is made of body, soul, and spirit. And she was like, a human being is made of body and the breath of life. So I said, no, that is not the case, because when a human being dies, your soul or your spirit goes back to God. And the person was like, it is the breath of life that goes back to God, but there is nothing like spirit. And I ever had the opportunity of reading um, one of the, the old versions of um, the Bible. Um, I don't know whether it was King James, but it's printed by Cambridge University Press. And uh, the presentation is, if I should say, somewhat special and somewhat different from what we have today. And I read um, from the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was a formless void. And, I mean, from our present text today, it says, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. And uh, those, are, that is, those are one of um, the evidences that we have today of the Holy Spirit. But when I actually read from that particular text, it says, the wind blew over the waters. Sort of like, um, I mean, it, 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 it sort of made sense today because, I mean, when you go to the seaside, there, there is a lot of wind. Sorry. Yes. When you go to the seaside, there is a lot of wind which causes um, the waves and all of that. And actually, that particular Bible that I'm referring to, it, it, it said that the wind blew over the water instead of the Spirit of God. 
but then it also makes um, reference to the Holy Spirit when it comes to the teachings of Jesus Christ. And sometimes I wonder, and actually this evening somebody also spoke of um, the Spirit in that God took his Spirit from Saul. And I see yet another interpretation of this issue of um, Spirit. They say it is um, the breath of life, some say it is the wind, and in the case of um, when you say God took his spirit from Saul, it could also mean the favor of God departed from Saul. So um, I don't know whether um, when you take the original um, Bible, say the Greek or the Hebrew Bible from which we have our Bible today, I don't know whether the original word used for the Holy Spirit say in the teachings of Jesus Christ is the same way that was used in say Genesis when we, it, um, it was sort of describing the creation and also that which was also used may in you, the case may of May you just round so, up because it's almost yes, 8 and yes, I want I'm to done. encourage people to be coming. If yes, it gets I'm longer done. they won't come from work. Yes, so I'm try and done. use 30 seconds to round up your point, your question and let me address it. Last week we started by looking at the Holy Spirit. And the first thing I talked about is the ruah, the breath. So I don't know if you were present last week. You were. So you see that we started by saying that how is the Holy Spirit presented in the Bible? And we said it is from the Hebrew. Ruah. Now, that is what is translated in the Genesis encounter you're talking about. When everything was tohu abuhu and then the God's spirit hovered over at the waters. So in the sense in which biblical translations will either use breath or spirit, they are all translating that same Hebrew word. And if you go into the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, where Jesus begins to talk about being baptized from heaven and all that, you will see Jesus also making allusion using that wind expression there. And it's also rua, which is being played out in the Greek equivalent of the term. Right? Now, we are not being, basing our answers on the belief or, so, or not belief of the Jehovah's Witnesses. We are basing our teaching on the Holy Spirit by what is revealed to us in the scriptures. First of all, the Holy uh, Witnesses don't believe in our Bible, do they? The Jehovah's Witness, they don't believe in our Bible. So there's no way that they will use your Bible to justify an argument you are making. You get what I mean? So we go into the Bible and see how did Jesus present the Holy Spirit? And how is the Holy Spirit presented to us? And that is why we see that the Holy Spirit is not presented as a person in the sense that Jesus is presented. But it's presented as a life-giving force. And so you have the various images which are used to represent the Holy Spirit. And in none of them would you find the Holy Spirit as a person per se. It is that force which we use the wind, the breath, and everything to communicate how he operates. But that does not mean because he's not a person in the sense of physically identifying the person, therefore we are wrong. If you want, we can continue outside. But like I said, it's almost 8 o'clock. And I want to make it so attractive that people can come every Tuesday knowing that we can finish early, they can go home, and they will come back. If it drags on, they wouldn't. So I'll be at the back, and we can continue the conversation. But understand fundamentally that, first of all, they don't believe in our Bible. And we use our Bible to explain who the Holy Spirit is. And there are evidences that breath, the ruah of God, is the Holy Spirit. And whether from the Greek or from the Hebrew, we see those translations at play in how the Holy Spirit is defined and how his rule is portrayed to us. So we'll now stand. Once again, thank you for coming. Next week we'll continue with another article of faith. And I want to encourage you to keep coming. When I see you, I'm happy. Let us keep learning about our faith.
I want to try and make it 30 minutes so I can get home early and every week keep coming. So we'll end by praying the prayer we prayed last week. It's a prayer to the Holy Spirit and we say it usually on Pentecost Sunday. Together let us pray. Come. free from taint of air. Heal our wounds, our strength renew. On our dryness pour your dew. Wash the stains of guilt away. Bend the stubborn heart and well. Melt the frozen, warm the chill. Guide the steps that go astray. On the faithful who adore and confess to you, evermore in your sevenfold gift descend. Give them virtue's sure reward. Give them your salvation, Lord. Give them joys that never end. Amen. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. The Almighty God bless you. The Father the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go forth. The Mass is ended. Hymn number 1 311 311